what's the opposite? I'll say, you know, what's the opposite of trauma? And people will often say relaxation. Huh. And I say, uh, uh, what would yeah, right. you say as an answer to that? Well, my basic definition of relaxation is of, of relaxation is appropriate effort. If you need to get off a train track and you're just relaxed, you won't mind it when the train hits you, but that's not really useful. If you're relaxed, you can move more easily and get off the train track. If you're uptight, it's hard to move. So what's the opposite of trauma? Trauma is not a thing. It doesn't have an opposite. It's a series of behaviors. The opposite of, Go on. The opposite of those behaviors are, are the behaviors of compassion and power. If you're just powerful, powerful, I'm sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Back on the line, given we're, we're, we're quite far across the world, aren't we? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. For anyone who didn't hear, I'm uh, in an apartment in Lviv, and all my students are in the bomb shelter right now, uh, doing a class down there. So, um, yeah, in terms of the things I've, I've been teaching here, a lot of it's super influenced by you, of course. Um, you know, lots of, lots of centering, but I think the piece around empowerment is key. The, yes. It's not just about relaxing, yeah? If you're relaxed, you can't do anything, but you won't mind it when somebody runs over you with a car. But if you're powerful and relaxed, you can get out of the way. You can take over the car if you need. You can fight freely and without damaging your own soul if you're in, in, in your center. So I know that people who, are, who have been tortured and... Uh, worse, aren't terribly interested in being compassionate, probably at the moment, but I can demonstrate that, that what I call compassion enables you to fight better, enables you to see what's in front of you, deal with it better, and fight back if you need to. So I'm not just talking about meditating and forgiveness and compassion, good stuff, but it must be joined to something practical or it won't help. I guess the other thing as well is the classes I teach with the people learning to work with trauma here are very practical and there's lots of exercises and movement you know like why would you say you couldn't just kind of sit there and do it you know i can't just do a lecture and people take notes in the traditional form that because that, that's what some people are expecting when they turn up right and then they're kind of yeah. a bit like what well we're standing up we're doing things we're moving well if you had somebody come to you who had developed the fear of water by nearly drowning would you talk to them and, take, and tell them to, to take notes about swimming? Would you tell them to, I'm going to take you into the water. You're going to learn to swim and do it well and enjoy it. You, you'll master the medium. Then you won't be afraid of it. So if you just talk, it's like giving somebody, a, a starving person, a menu. Nice. Yeah, I use the menu analogy as well with people. And... Um... <laughs> What about the issue of something called vicarious trauma or a secondary trauma? So a lot of the people I'm teaching with volunteers in Poland, you know, they're working with refugees, they're uh, people, my students here in Lviv are now working with soldiers, with refugees, with people who have been through a lot of stuff. You know, aside from the occasional mild bombing, we're not under that much, you know, danger in Lviv. Right. But the, we're, we're working with people who really have been to hell and back. And there's a way in which it can kind of rub off. Like I was I just did a supervision yes. session last night with uh, 10 of the trainers who've just spent the last month doing trainings, you know, over a thousand people they've, they've now taught. Um, and, you know, it's starting to show a little bit. There's yeah. a sort of way in which their bodies have changed since I saw them a month ago. And, um, you know, what would you say in terms of help with this vicarious trauma, of just the trauma of the body picks up being right. around other people with trauma? Yes. I'd say, may I try something, please? And uh, presumably they'd say yes, and we'd go through safety procedures and all. What do you feel now? God. In your body. Yep. Kind of depressing. All right. <laughs> it's, we, we communicate through copying each other's body states. When I do this, what does your body do? What do you do in your body? Yes. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's not that it rubs off. You see it and you do it. 
that we're built that way. That's what our communication is. You have to know how to not do what you see and not take in what other people's behavior is and do and copy it in your system. That you can't stop anything. You have to start something better. Get what I mean? So you can't stop taking in somebody's somebody's traumatized message. You have to start something which is non-traumatized, which is more, that's the negative still. You have to start something which is compassionate, spacious, grounded, open, joyful, as well as you can under the circumstances. And that will replace the, the vicarious trauma process. It's not nouns, it's, it's, it's verbs, it's behaviors. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've never seen you taught that, but you've taught me these principles. I, I did almost the exact same exercise with the group yesterday. I slumped in my chair and I said, don't copy me. <laughs> right, and I had, had right. a hard time. Yeah, right. getting, I did anxious rather than aggressive. I started, you know, breathing up here and kind of putting on an anxious embodiment. And um, again, I was like, don't copy me. And you see some people that, you know, we all have mirror neurons, we all see, we all copy. And the other thing I really picked up from your work is that it's important to be accurate about the process so you can do a different process. Yes. So for example, if someone says, oh, it's a negative energy going into me. Now, as a metaphor, that, that's okay, right? Well, like it I, is for some I, people, I don't understand the metaphor. The question is, what do you mean by it? Is it publicly ob observable? What do you mean? Can you replicate it? Can you teach it to somebody? If the words will communicate the actions that you're, you're trying to teach it doesn't matter what the words are but if you give somebody a metaphor which doesn't produce the actual actions in the body that would be helpful and healing it's a great metaphor but it doesn't get anybody anywhere so it has right. to be concrete it's got to be accurate as well right like like for example i have a question like someone said uh, guilt's a big problem so I'd love to get your take on this. It's pretty cultural. In Poland, it's very pop popular. We have a lot of jokes about Catholic guilt in, uh, in Poland and Ukraine. There. And um, uh, people say, what do I do if someone makes me feel guilty? Well, that's a grammatical problem. They don't make you feel guilty. You make yourself feel guilty about what they are doing or what you're doing. You can have learned that. I was talking to somebody in Ireland the other day who was amazed to, to hear that I was Jewish and I didn't have any resonances with Jesus Christ. He says the words and all kinds of things about being an altar boy come in, things that he was told about his behavior. There, it's put into them, but if, if it isn't put in, it isn't there. He, he was just amazed to think that somebody could have zero resonance with that whole thing that was so important in his life. So you have to, you have to be accurate. You have to know what the actual processes and you have to be accurate in your words you can't use a noun where verbs should be used because that will tell you you can't release anger the, the way you release a plate or something so that's a different kind of accuracy it's an accuracy about the logic of your understanding not just the accuracy of the the, the event they're both yeah. very important i i sort of tried to prove my point by saying um make me feel guilty for having sex with chickens um, <laughs> Of course, I don't have sex with chickens. And, you know, they would sort of say, you know, you should feel bad. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm cool. And, you know, because I wasn't willing to put that thought process through my head and to do anything in my body about this. And look, you can't make me feel bad for having sex with chickens. That's not something I do, but it's not something, you know, I'm not willing to do the bodily actions that would go along with sort of feeling bad for this. And no, if you um, just change the language, Mark, you said, I, I didn't want to put that thought in my head. Now you've just said, I don't want to do the bodily actions of feeling guilty. So, so what man. would be your advice if someone says, yeah, yeah, I know it's not my fault. For example, I have a student who's like, look, I feel really guilty that I've, I'm relatively safe here in Aviv. And, you know, my husband's fighting on the front lines and blah, blah, blah. Like, I feel really guilty. What, what would be your kind of intervention in that point? Well, I'd have to see the specific person, but I'll try to give you a ballpark. Mm -hmm. I'd first off say, what are you doing in your body that you're naming guilt? What effects does it have? And I'm assuming, though I wouldn't say it, that they're using up a lot of energy, a lot of alertness and such, focusing on the, the, the fear that something would happen to her husband. Would you do better to do something that would be useful or just to stand there and ruin your body, feeling negative about yourself and your behavior. 
put your energy towards something that'll work. Yeah, yeah. And we were seeing a collapse or a twist. You know, there was slight, right. some small variations on like what people kind of call fight or flight. But actually, I, in my experience, it goes a bit broader than that. You know, it's also, we, I see we have a, a, Buddhist, a Buddhist monk here. So grasping is also very similar in the, you know, tanha in the Buddhist tradition is very similar to fight or flight. It's just going in the opposite direction. And in my experience, what people call guilt shame has often got a very similar uh, tense embodiment as well. Yes. People tend to spread negative affects from one thing to another. I had a client once who was deathly afraid of red shirts. When she finally re-experienced why, she realized that she'd been raped as a little girl and all she could see was a red shirt in front of her face and she could feel the terrible pain. So it spread from red shirts to other kinds of shirts to men. Pretty soon she was afraid of everything because anything could be linked to a red shirt by a chain, a, con a concatenation of, of coincidences or whatever. So we, we learn very well and it's the problem we have to not unlearn, we have to replace the learning. And then the other, the other thing I really got from you is calibration yes. and consent. And I, I teach this to students, not just as uh, an ethical principle, like, you know, don't harm your students, don't, you know, don't do things to people without consent, which I think we'd probably all agree with here, but also in a way, it is also the sort of empowering heart of trauma yes. work. It's like you have boundaries, you have permission, you can say yes or no to things. And then the calibration idea of um, it's got to be the right dose. You know, from Aikido, we learned that you don't, someone just walks in on day one as a white belt. You don't just kind of, you know, just throw a full paste punch at their head. You start with a gentle wrist grab or something they can, they can handle. Yeah. And we're using this idea of calibration around everything we do. Yeah. It's very important because if, you don't, if you're not calibrating, if you're thinking about a technique, this is how we deal with this problem you're not actually seeing the person in front of you. And all of these principles, of course, apply to everything, all the work I do, whether it's trauma. Um, I actually took a couple of brief videos of myself working in the garden, one using a pickaxe, the other sawing a piece of metal in half. And it's very interesting. I, I, I thought it would look the way it does, and, and maybe next week I'll play them. But they're very centered, they're very... When I saw I'm not doing this with my arm, and actually in forward stride sense, I'm using my body weight to move the saw. The arm stays relaxed. I could get a lot more power from the legs into the saw. So it's not just trauma, but the very same principles of calm, effective action apply to everything. That's what's nice about it. You learn just a few principles. You can go wherever you need with them. Yeah, yeah, and I, I find it's interesting what motivates people because it's a trauma workshop. But I say, you know, this will very likely be very helpful for your parenting, or I'll make jokes. I say, look, this might accidentally make you more attractive. I apologize for that. And uh, this might make you a better leader at work. You know, we talk about kind of the different um, ways in which uh, there's positive impacts, whether it be on sort of a health level through not being tense and all the different, you know, impacts on the immune system, blah, 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 whether it be on leadership, whether it be a physical thing, if they're, we have, you know, yogis, dancers, martial artists in the group, and um, uh, people have different interests, but because the principles are so broad, they often go across uh, all these different areas as benefits. The title of my new book, which I haven't checked, I think it might be up on the website, if not today, in the next couple of days, I hope. It's all the same except for the differences. I mean it. The same principles carry across. For those of you, I don't know if there's anybody, I can't see if there's anybody on here who doesn't know me, who hasn't been with one of my classes before. Well, let's see what I can do this morning. This is my daily test. I've had Parkinson's for 20 years. I'm standing on one foot more stably than I ever have before I'm learning. But... Uh, what I'm doing carries across all kinds of impossibilities. But if, it's, if I do, it must be possible, I guess. And Paul, what are some of the other sort of deeper principles or fundamental principles in what you do? Because like, I, I find that once I know them, I can just do make up games, you know, play. Yes, of course. They always say, oh, you're so creative. You do these things. I'm like, well, no, I just know a few things. And then I can just apply them in a million different ways. 
It's all the same except for the differences. Um, let's see what's another good one. Watch out for nouns. They they will trick you. The thing we're not dealing with things. We're dealing with processes. Um, feelings are actions in the body. Emotions are actions in the body. That's a very important one. And it's very counterintuitive. Most people believe that emotions are some kind of vapor that goes through your head and you clean it out with mental floss, I guess. But um, feelings are, are things you do in your body. And if you're doing them and you're aware of them, you have the choice of whether or not to do them or modify them. I think that may be one of the most crucial. What yeah, else? Put another one, Bullet, that you, you test things a lot. Yes, so okay. This, this, I mean, this has always gone down well with my audiences that they don't have to believe anything. I say, look, yes, give it a go. See, yeah. find out for yourself. See what, you know, how is it for you? And let's do this little experiment, you know, physical action or towel hitting we were doing. Today. When, you know, it's one thing saying to people, love is more powerful than hate. You know, that sounds like a nice thing, right? And people either agree, but they're not really convinced because it, it's on a surface level. Or it's, um, they disagree and we have a big argument, but then you go, okay, just hit. Hit the, hit the chair with the towel. Let's see. Is it stronger to do it this way? Yeah. The, the fact of what I've done is join Western analytic scientific hypothesis, hypothesis construction and testing procedures to the Eastern awareness procedures that I learned in Aikido. And it turns out if you use the testing procedures, it keeps you on the straight and narrow. You don't become arrogant and I know everything and everything I say is true because everybody has the right and the duty to test for themselves what you say. And if it doesn't work, then you've been disconfirmed and you've got to go back to the lab and find out what was wrong, what was wrong with your approach before. So it's, it, it breeds a kind of respect and humility, the idea of testing. It also keeps people from running off in the wrong direction. And a lot of the logic that people use, if I say, this is a, if I, that's a good example. Okay, if I, if I shake my hands, it will rain. And I shake my hands and it does rain. That doesn't prove anything because you have to have the specific, specific hypothesis con constructed such that both the, the confirmation and the disconfirmation will be there. So if somebody says, see, I shook my hands and it's raining, and then they try it the next time and it doesn't rain, they say, well, it's still true, it's just I didn't do it right. That's cheating. You have to be able to specify what, will, what evidence will show that thing, something doesn't work and what evidence will show that a formulation does work. So if you take that kind of testing approach, it vastly clarifies what people are doing. Yeah, yeah, and that, that testing can be objective feedback or even just how does this feel, right? Like in terms of the subject of like, putting people in different states and be like, okay, how, would, how is it to parent from here? How is it, you know, are you able to have an intimate connection from here? Yeah. Which manager would you most likely listen to? And, and normally there's a sort of obviousness to that where yeah. someone can try and argue that it's really useful to be angry, but then when you give them the experiment of angry boss versus <laughs> centered boss, they go, yeah, I like the second one better. Let's try something then. As long as we're talking about it, let's not talk about it while we talk about it. Everybody stand up if you wish. And try standing on one foot, either one. You can, stand, you can lift both feet off the floor. You're really on a different level. But try standing on one foot. See what happens to your balance when you get angry. Swear at somebody. What does that do? What do people experience in their bodies? There are no right answers, there are no wrong answers, they're just your answers. What do people feel? Less stable when I when I swear at someone. Yeah. You have to be an unstable personality. And if you want to attain a state of grace, you have to be present and in, in your balance and your body. And the way I express it often, as we've mentioned here, love without power is ineffective power without love is brutality 
And that's very strange. Most people don't have any conception of what happens when you put the two of them together. I was doing a workshop and a woman who was, her parents were Holocaust survivors. She was, she had just seen uh, what was Gabor Mate's movie and it's a lovely movie. But I pointed out when we were talking about it, when she raised it, that there was no power in the victims. The only, the only power was in the Nazis. And she said, you know, you're right. And my, she, she had inherited from her parents the feeling that power was inevitably evil. And she realized when she felt it, that power with compassion is the only way you can be strong enough to do good in the world. So that's what we're trying to achieve. I don't know why people enjoy feeling bad, but clearly they do. They wouldn't start wars. But uh, I'm trying to change that and hope, hope other people will help in this way. Thanks, Paul. One, one sure. of my colleagues actually joked here, said, Mark, you're confusing people. You're being kind and holding boundaries with the group. And like, oh, <laughs> so that, that's just like you keep confusing people. They're, 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 you're strict, but at the same time, you're kind. And it was like I was so, you know, OK, we start the class here and please turn your phones off and it was almost counter-cultural yes. and it was explained to me that you know like hey you know this country was under communism for a long time and then you know various attacks and the idea that anyone in authority could could sort of have your interests at heart or be kind was a sort of very foreign idea and um it was just literally a very strange notion to people in a way and i actually see Ukraine as a country leaning away from the idea of abusive power as a mm -hmm. way of doing anything. And there's a sort of care around in the whole culture, like, hey, we have to fight this war and it kind of sucks and we'd rather not. And you say winning is healing. And you can see sort of people here kind of liking the idea that like winning is also not getting fucked up. Right. right. We don't want to become monsters here. Um, and it's it, it, one of the first, I've been around a few wars, and it's one of the first ones that I've been around that's been trauma aware, at least on a fairly significant level from the beginning. So mm -hmm. it's not, we have a war, then we find out about trauma and, oh my God, we've got PTSD 20 years later, let's see what we can do about it. It's really people, there's quite a lot of psychologists here, and it's the first time I've seen, not every person, obviously, but significant numbers of people have an awareness of trauma as the war is happening, not 10 years after Vietnam or whatever. So I think that's, it sounds weird because I'd rather there was no war, but as a second best option, a war where there's some trauma awareness, at least on one side of things is, is, is pretty cool. I, I think that you're right. And there's another step. It's not just being aware of the processes of trauma. It's being aware also of what, processes will go to minimize or help you become resilient in the face of trauma. And those are about being present and strong, free, kind-hearted, et cetera, et cetera. So I think if people go into it, well, one of the examples I use in my book, have you ever heard a government say, look, they attacked us. We've got to kill some of them to convince them not to kill more of us, but don't hate them. Remember, we have to live with them after us. They're brothers and sisters. Husbands and wives are just like us. Let's kill some, but don't hate them. And that, that's literally what I've been saying. Like, and also that someone had an argument here of like, um, oh, we need to hate them to kill them. I was like, no, no, if you want to fire a javelin missile straight, you need to be relaxed. So I'm afraid you have to love them. I'm terribly sorry. Right, and, yeah. and then do some demonstrations around that. And, and I'm like, look, the other argument I've been making is like, look, if, if you fall victim to hate, not only is it less effective, but also you lose. No, right? You become like, what the perpetrator was. Like, do you want mm -hmm. to be getting your kids or having a divorce? Or as I said to a bunch of soldiers here, they said, we're not really interested in trauma. And I said, well, are you interested in having sex with your wives when you come home? Um, and, and they started listening, you know? And it's, it's amazing. It get people's attention in different ways. But um, the idea that you're losing effectiveness and doing something ethically harmful to oneself by doing violence. Uh, I think that's, um, yeah, that, that's a strange idea to many people, but I do see an openness to it here. And um, also, you know, what we're doing here in terms of just training large numbers of people, like mm -hmm. we're, we're on something like 150 trauma trainers trained by the end of this. Very good. Uh, like just, just teaching thousands of people some of these ideas. 
Um, and, I, and I think that that is possible with basic trauma education and simple tools like the ones that you teach that are fairly quick and easy to pass on. Mm -hmm. We don't need to do a three year therapy qualification for someone to right. pass on. That's why I developed them this way. So they would be quick and easy. I usually use a thought experiment. If you're going through the woods with a with a rifle to shoot tin cans off a rock, that's not violent or unethical. And you see a dog, a beautiful dog with rabies. Do you pet it? No. Would you kill it? I think you'd have to, or it would die anyway in great pain and perhaps infect others. So if you did shoot it, would you hate it? No. You could kill it while feeling respect and sorrow and compassion for the dog. It's not necessary to hate to fight. In fact, it, it interferes with the fighting. I define violence as behaviors coming out of fear and anger with a de desire to diminish and, and de-exist is a word I made up. So if you want to hurt somebody, if you derive some pleasure from it, that's violent. Simply destroying or breaking is not necessarily violent. It could be very life-affirming. That's a very important, I think it's a very important thought to keep in mind as you use force. What Thanks. do you want to become? What do you want to become through using the forest? We're coming to time here. So I just want to say if people are interested in pool stuff, I know Paul's got a, a mentorship program that's we're closing pretty soon. If you're interested in that message, Virginia, there may be some charity places as well uh, as the sort of regular ones. So just send an email to Virginia if you're in your email to Virginia if you're interested in that. If you're interested in what we're doing in Ukraine, say Ukraine dot org is the uh, website for that and it's just got ukrainian charity status which is cool it's now owned and run by two ukrainian women not by me i now the joke is i'm now their boss uh, not their boss sorry they're my boss and uh, it's got local locally run locally funded which is pretty cool and um you know if you want to donate to that you can but no no pressure of course uh, so, I have yeah. also, Mark, uh, you, I'd like to hear from him, hear about it. I've offered to do a day-long training workshop for free for the Ukrainians. I just couldn't at the time when it was first brought up do anything more than I was. I have some time now. And I would like to say one last thing briefly. Um, Ukraine, as I understand it, was one of the places that was had the most serious pogroms against the Jews back in the late... 1800s early 1900s and now there's a jewish president and so things can change and putin is is trying to denazify ukraine which is crazy but things can change people can learn to value each other we just have to work at it yeah never met a nazi here so i don't know where putin's going on about with the jewish president as well but um very strange to me this piece of propaganda but uh, yeah, things can change, things can get better. And certainly even in the time I've done this stuff, I've, I've seen there just being an openness to trauma work, which is just hugely encouraging. And Paul, just a personal thank you for me as, as my mentor and someone that's loved and supported me through the years and given me encouragement. And um, you know, this Ukraine project is definitely one of the better things I've done with my life and I definitely wouldn't have been able to do it without you. So um, thank you, sir, love you lots. <laughs> I, I really have valued our connection down through the years. And the gift you've given me is to use some of the stuff that I had to work hard to understand to help others. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, love you, man. I've got to get back to get back to my students in the bomb shelter. I'm, I'm quite uh, not, not so smart being in, the, in an apartment right now. Well, three floors up, so I've been head off. You, you, want, you want my latest joke? Go Life. on. Torture me. <laughs> Life is a good news, bad news, terrible news joke. The good news is that there's bad news coming. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll uh, forgive you. It's not that. terrible news, it's a little obscure. If it's just bad news coming, that's better than the terrible news. I gotta run, I'll catch you later. Cheers, everyone. Mark, I just <laughs> want to appreciate you so much. I just, I am so grateful to you and I adore you to pieces. So good luck, my dear. Thank you. Yeah. As a reminder to everyone, you can save the chat. It'll also be posted on the website, uh, both the video, the chat, and I think also the, um, what's it called? The automatic subtitles that are often quite humorous. There was something very bawdy and yeah, it right. wasn't Paul's words in one of them when I clicked on it. I was like, anyway, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody. Thank Notice you, everybody. My, my, my joke got rid of Mark very quickly. <laughs>
Um, and really, everyone, so, the two, oh, Virginia those, is probably going to make that announcement. Yeah, Go for, ahead. For those watching the recording of this, assuming you're in the portal already, you can reach out to me in the portal via message. I'm typing also my name in the chat. It's Virginia Muklia. And uh, you can find me in the portal or if you're interested in um, Paul's mentorship and you can't find me in the portal, just make a question in the community chat. Uh, say, hey, I'm interested in Paul's mentorship. It will be closing soon. So this is not, I think it's next week or sooner. So the, the clock is ticking. And if you want to email me your email for interest, if you're watching the recording, you can email virginia at embodimentunlimited.com. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure everybody, including the people who watch the recordings, know that. And if you've got friends who you think may be interested in trauma work with Paul Linden, this is a great opportunity. Please spread the word. Tell a friend who you think might be interested, because if you're coming here, I don't need to speak to Paul's work. Please either. remember that this is not trauma work. It's work on, on centering and compassionate power. Trauma is just one of the applications. It happens to be possibly the most important, at the, certainly at the moment. But if you're working on trauma, well, like we can always find some trauma for you, I guess. <laughs> Do not hesitate to take advantage of this opportunity, everybody. I sound like a salesperson, but really, you know, this is a great chance. And, um, you know, maybe take a few minutes just to feel into yourself of whether working with Paul would be useful for you at this time. And if it is, please don't hesitate to reach out to Virginia. And if you can't figure out how well, to find her, reach out to Paul, Lisa, or myself. We'll all hold on to you and send you in the right direction. And look forward to seeing you here in, in, in eternity. In eternity? In eternity. I came up with a new word, Paul. I came up with a new word. Yes, it's someone who thinks a lot. It's an experiential, and then someone who thinks a lot but doesn't do anything good with it. That's an experi-ignorant person. Mm -hmm. Experience yeah. and intelligence. Ex applying your intelligence or ex applying your ignorance. I came up with <laughs> one. What the police cars do in the uh, parking lot after the police go home? They copulate. Oh, oh, I can't unsee so before that. I end, uh, before I end, there we go. Before I end the recording and the really terrible jokes start, uh, if you are interested at all in learning with Paul and you're thinking that uh, two years is a long commitment, how do I know that I'm going to stick it out for two years and whether that's even a fit, um, please express your interest anyway. Um, I know Paul is uh, is having um, uh, some conversations, but there is probably going to be a two month or three month trial period where uh, you can check this out and uh, figure out whether this is a fit for everybody involved. Yes. If you are interested at all, please uh, reach out, uh, fill out the, the handy dandy form. Uh, you're not locked into two years. And on that note, I will say thank you again to Paul and Dana and Virginia and Mark, and I will stop the recording here. <laughs>